Hello, everyone, and welcome to another mini sky tonight. So in honor of Father's Day, I wanted to show you guys some of the constellations and planets and things that you can take your father out and go look up at the stars with. I know as the summer has approached us and we're all stuck at home, uh, hopefully some things are starting to open up, but I know for many things, a lot of things have been canceled. So here's something you can do with your father just to go out and about, look up at the stars. So let's look at some of the deep sky objects as well as some of the planets and constellations that you can see. So I'm using the program called Stellarium. It's a free planetarium program and I'll leave a link in the description uh, how you can download it for your own computer. In fact, if I recall correctly, they also have an app version as well that you can download to help you be able to navigate the sky wherever you are. So here we are in the program Stellarium looking towards the west just shortly after sunset. Just even close after sunset, you can start to see a couple of little stars peek out. But there's one in particular that is incredibly bright. In fact, two of them will be kind of a little brighter than the rest of them. This one in particular right here, this is actually the planet Venus. So in the early evening sky, you can see the planet Venus. In fact, let's take an up close and personal view of this planet. So currently Venus is in a position to where you can see it in a gibbous phase, meaning mostly full. So you get to see a good portion of the planet Venus. Venus is often referred to as our sister planet because she's just slightly smaller than Earth and has a rocky surface and has a beautiful thick atmosphere. But that's all we have in common. Venus is actually a very hellish planet. And what I mean by that is that the temperature there is incredibly high. It's over 900 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. The two landers that landed on Mars of Venera 7 and 9 didn't make it very long after they landed because of just the extreme conditions on Venus. The atmospheric pressure there is 90 times that of Earth's. It would literally feel like you were a mile underneath the ocean kind of pressure. The temperature is over 900 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's hot enough to melt lead. And to make matters worse, the atmosphere is incredibly toxic for humans to breathe. It has carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, plus a bunch of other gases, which are very nasty to breathe. So it's not a safe place to visit. So hence why, in order to be able to understand the landscape of Venus, we've had to use the technique known as radar to be able to pierce through the clouds and take a look at the surface. There are a couple of spacecraft that are there right now hoping to be able to understand the climate of Venus. Like, does it vary in temperature? And why is it, it the temperatures are indeed so high? The other bright star I wanted to show you, which is not really a star at all, is just up and to the left of Venus just shortly after sunset is the planet Mars. So in the early evening sky towards the west northwest, you can see two planets in the early evening sky. And if you have a pair of binoculars or small telescope, you can zoom in on these planets to see a couple of unique features. They'll look like kind of bright orbs in the sky, but you can definitely tell that they're not stars compared to you can see these disks in the sky. So they are indeed planets. So let's take an up close and personal view of Mars. Now that little, these two little stars that are right close to Mars are actually the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. And they're kind of captured asteroids. They have a lot of similarities to C-type asteroids or carbon-type asteroids in the asteroid belt than they do with actual Mars itself. Unlike our moon, which astronomers believe that the moon was once a part of the Earth and it has kind of similar structure and composition to that of the Earth, these two moons have nothing in common. So it's thought 
that these moons were technically captured, but there's something odd about these two moons is because usually if it's a captured asteroid, it kind of has an elliptical orbit. These two moons actually have very circular orbits. So astronomers believe that maybe they were captured, but they were captured during the early formations of Mars itself. We don't know. Nonetheless, looking at the surface of Mars, you can definitely see this bright, deep red orange color, and it's often affectionately referred to as the red planet. And the reason being is because the soil on Mars is rich in iron. And since we've discovered water on Mars and it has a bit of an atmosphere, the iron has oxidized or rusted. So that's why it has that deep red orange color. It's mostly rust covering the surface of the planet and it's relatively cold. The average temperature on Mars is negative 20 degrees below zero. It's pretty frigid on Mars. So if we're gonna send astronauts someday to be able to visit Mars, we're going to need to have to have special types of suits to keep the astronauts warm. All right, so this is the early evening sky, but as you can tell, in the early evening sky, when there's still a little bit of glow of the sun, you really can't see any constellations. So let's set the sun a little bit to actually see some of the constellations and stars a little more. Nonetheless, so here's Venus, and as you can kind of tell a little better, there's that bright star of Mars. So you kind of can see it's red orange color even in the sky. But currently right now on Father's Day, if you look to the left a little bit with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, is a really unique object hidden right here. It's not that designation. I just happened to click on one of the stars. But in this unique little area is a cluster. It's known as an open cluster. This is what is referred to as the beehive cluster. It's a unique type of open cluster, meaning that the stars are spread out just enough to where you can see space in between stars. And it's unique is because on a clear moonless night, you can see it with the unaided eye, meaning you don't need a pair of binoculars or a telescope to see it. And ancient navigators often used the beehive cluster as kind of like a weather indicator. If they couldn't see the beehive cluster on a clear moonless night, it meant that the atmosphere was choppy for it to be able to be seen. And that told them, hey, a storm might be on the way. Well, let's look for a couple of different constellations. Over here towards the western horizon, you kind of see this backwards question mark in the sky. This is a part of the constellation Leo, the lion. And the bright star at the bottom of the question mark is the star called Regulus. It's referred to as the king star. And it kind of makes sense. You got the king of the beasts there, so you get the king star. Now, some people say they can see a lion, because you kind of can see a lion if it was like in the sphinx pose. Like here's the curl of his mane and here's his body and he's got his paws hanging out here. I've had a couple of different people call it by different asterisms or nicknames. One particular friend of mine has called it the cobra because he says he sees a kind of like a snake that's twirled around on itself and here's the part of the cobra. I had a student of mine, since I do teach astronomy, they said they see a mouse. So like here's the head and the nose and the body and little tail and just imagine a pair of ears up here. That's the great thing about asterisms. Asterisms, you can call them whatever you want. If it makes it easier for you to remember a particular constellation in the sky and where it is, go for it.
And also another great thing about asterisms too is that you can make your own constellation. If you don't see a lion or anything of that nature out of that, you can connect the stars in whatever way you wish and call it your own constellation. Nonetheless, bright up in the sky, towards the south, you'll obviously see the moon. So let's take an up close and personal view of our closest celestial body. Now, right now the moon is mostly in a waxing gibbous phase, meaning mostly full. And the best place to view the moon with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope is this line right here. It's what is known as the terminator line or the daytime nighttime line. The moon experiences day and night similar to Earth, but on a different time scale. Since the moon rotates at the same rate as it goes around the Earth, we always see one side of the moon at all times. So a day on the moon is roughly 29 and a half days. So every 29 and a half days, it goes from noon to noon again. So it takes a while for the sun to change on the surface of the moon. But nonetheless, on this daytime nighttime line, if you look with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, it's easier to see some of the craters and you can kind of see a little bit of shadowing to kind of give you a rough idea how wide and deep some of these craters are. So that's the best place to view it. Although as a tip of advice, if you are looking at the moon with a pair of binoculars or small telescope, keep in mind it is incredibly bright. So you may walk away from like looking with a pair of binoculars, looking up and then realizing, oh, I can't see anything. My eyes, it hurts uh, because you're looking at an incredibly bright object. So just a fair warning. All right, let's look for a couple of different constellations. So let's look in the north here really quick. And there's this group of stars over here that many people recognize with four stars that kind of form a bowl and three stars that form a handle. This is the famous asterism known as the Big Dipper. And I emphasize asterism because the bigger constellation is Ursa Major, the Great Bear, as you can see right here. Yeah, I don't see a bear out of that either. I like to call it the Big Dipper as well because it's easier for me to remember it. So great thing about asterisms, you can call them whatever you want if it makes it easier for you to remember. Nonetheless, notice that the Big Dipper's handle kind of makes a curve. If you follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle, you run into this star right here. In fact, let's rotate this guy just a tad. So follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle to this star right here. This is the bright star known as Arcturus. So the easiest way to remember of how to find this star is you arc to Arcturus. Arcturus is in the constellation Bootes, the herdsman. I call it Bootes, even though it's in some translations is called B-O-O-T-E-S. And the original naming of this constellation, one of the O's has umlauts. It's a Germanic name for the shepherd, but I apologize if I butcher the name. I, German was not an easy language for me to be able to pronunciate. So if I butcher it, I apologize. I am still trying to learn, but it one of the O's has umlauts on it, so it gives it a ooh kind of sound. Nonetheless, over to the left of the constellation Bautes is this U-shaped constellation. It's given the nickname the smile or the necklace in the sky, but it's actually a crown. It's known as Corona Borealis, or the Northern Crown. 
over to the left of Corona Borealis is this kind of weird Dixie cup shaped constellation or the keystone shaped constellation. It's a constellation of Hercules, the mighty hero. So even the Disney movie Hercules character is in the sky as well. But right underneath the armpit of Hercules is a really unique object. And just bear with me if I could try to click on it. Eh, it won't let me, but not a big deal. Nonetheless, right underneath the armpit around about in here is a really unique object. So earlier I showed you an open cluster. Now I'm gonna show you its opposite, what is known as a globular cluster. So let's take a look at this globular cluster. There it is. Now, can you see the difference? An open cluster is where you can see a lot of space in between the stars. This is what is known as a globular cluster, meaning like it's a big, huge glob of stars, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stars all compact into a tiny little area where the average distance between the stars is about the same distance between the Earth and the Sun. And they're all squeezed together in a small little area. So what is inside a globular cluster? Well, it contains some of the oldest stars because globular clusters exist outside of our galaxy. Because you have our galaxy with the beautiful arms and spirals in a disk type shape, but these globular clusters exist above and below the disk. Because during the early formations of our galaxies, when all the gas and dust was clumping together to form our galaxy, some of these clumps started to form many galaxies. So these are some of the oldest stars around our galaxy because our galaxy constantly recycles some of these stars because there's enough gas and dust to produce new stars. As old stars die off, they replenish some of the nebula there and keep recycling. But in the case of globular clusters, many of these stars haven't died off. So they've existed for several billions of years. So these are some of the oldest stars around our galaxy and they go in orbit around our galaxy. Whereas in many open clusters, our clusters that exist inside the galactic arms. So that's another difference between an open cluster and globular cluster. An open cluster has enough space in between the stars and astronomers believe that those spacings is caused by gravitational pulls from other things, allowing the space in between the stars to exist. Whereas in a globular cluster, since they existed outside of our galaxy, there wasn't a lot of gravitational pull to pull apart the stars. So they kind of gravitation uh, did a gravitational attraction to one another. So hence why they're all clumped together in a big, huge, quote unquote, glob. All right, so to go back again, we follow the arc of the Big Kipper's handle to Arcturus, and we found Boates, Corona Borealis, and the constellation Hercules. Oops, sorry. I always keep forgetting that if you point exactly at Zenith, it kind of does a weird twist and turn. I do apologize. I know sometimes it causes me to get a little dizzy, so I apologize. Nonetheless, if you spike down from Arcturus, you'll run into this incredibly bright blue star right here. This is a star known as Spica. So you arc to Arcturus and you spike to Spica. Spica is in the constellation Virgo. Now, yes, many people recognize her as quote unquote, the Virgin, but I honestly recognize her as the Virgin goddess Ceres, the goddess of harvest. And of course, uh, Spica is right close to the moon. And even though it's really close to the moon, you can still see the star Spica because it's an incredibly bright blue star. All right, let's look over here towards the east. 
you'll see these three bright stars close to the horizon. These three bright stars form the asterism or nickname of a pseudo constellation known as the Summer Triangle or the Navigator's Triangle. Because for many navigators navigating from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere, they use these three particular stars constantly for navigation. This top star right here is called Vega. Oh, forgive me. It's a part of the constellation Lyra, the Lyre, L-Y-R-E, not L-I-A-R. It's a harp. But hidden between the two stars at the bottom of the harp is a really unique object. It's kind of faint, but if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope and you can zoom in between these two stars, you'll see a really unique object. Bear with me here. It's really difficult to pinpoint some of these objects. There it is. That's the object I'm looking for. This is what is known as the Ring Nebula or M57. It's a telltale sign of what will happen to our star when it passes away. The process that's going in our sun right now is called nuclear fusion, where it's taking lighter elements, ramming them together to fuse into heavier elements while producing light heat and energy. Eventually it's gonna to start to run out of hydrogen to produce these lighter elements. And in doing so, it will try to conserve energy by puffing out its outer layers so that way it can start fusing some of the heavier elements on the inside, becoming a red giant. And then as it starts fusing heavier and heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, it will collapse down its core to keep the fusion process going. And then it will just puff out its outer layers like a cosmic ash ball around a central little white star. That little white star is called a white dwarf star. It's the core remnant of the star that once was. And it creates this beautiful ring type structure around the center star because those, that ring structure is the outer shells of the star that once was. And you kind of can see it right here. So you have this beautiful, colorful ring, but when you look at it with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, it'll kind of look like this fuzzy gray puff smoke. In fact, I had an audience member once tell me it kind of looked like somebody from like the Lord of the Rings who was smoking a pipe and he created this beautiful ring out with the smoke. It kind of looked like a smoke ring with a telescope. And inside the center of that ring, you can see that little white star right there. That's the core remnant of the star. The bottom left star of the summer triangle or the navigator's triangle is called Deneb. And it's a part of the constellation Cygnus, the swan but it's often given the asterism known as the Northern Cross. And I always kind of like, I'm picturing like this beautiful swan or a stick figure bird flying through the Milky Way galaxy. At the nose of the swan is a really unique star. It's called Alberio. It's actually a double star. Most stars come, come in double or triple star systems. Our star just happens to be unique where it's a single star. And most stars that are double and triple have a companion next to them about similar in size. What makes Alberio so unique is that the two stars are unique colors. In fact, it's often referred to as the Cub Scout star because one is a deep gold and the other one is a bright blue. So you can see two different colors of stars in these two stars. And of course, the bottom right star of the asterism known as the Summer Triangle is known as Altair. Altair is 
a part of the constellation Aquila, the eagle. It's kind of difficult to see the eagle. I, I imagine it kind of like a, looking like a similar eagle like you see on the back of a quarter. I've heard people call it the stingray, but call it whatever you will. Nonetheless, I want to show you a couple of different planets that you can see early in the morning. So if you're getting up early in the morning around Father's Day and want to take a peek out of some of the different things you can see up in the sky if you're up early in the morning, allow me to show you some things that you can see. So let's change the time to early in the morning, just before sunrise. So let's set the sun just a little bit more. So roughly around about 6 a.m. Let's take off the constellation lines. Because if you look towards the south, you will see two distinct bright stars that kind of overpower many of the other stars in the sky. Those stars are actually two planets. This one over to the southwest is Saturn. So let's take it up close and personal view of it. So even with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you can definitely see the rings of the planet. And that's why I always enjoy checking out Saturn is because many people recognize it as soon as they see it in a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. And you might even see a couple of little stars that are hanging around there, which are some of the moons of Saturn. And of course, the star that is to the left of that, it's incredibly bright, is the planet Jupiter itself. And if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you'll see this big, huge ball with a bunch of stripes on it. Those are the bands of Jupiter's cloud tops. And you'll get to see four of the moons of Jupiter. Those four bright moons are what are known as the Galilean moons because they were first discovered by Galileo Galilei. So you can definitely see four of the moons which kind of look like these little stars that are right next to the planet along with the big planet itself. So if you're willing to get up early in the morning to check out these two planets, they are a sight to behold indeed. All right, so these are some of the constellations and planets and deep sky objects that you can see around Father's time. So if you have any questions or comments, leave it down in the comments below. If there are topics you would love for me to cover over in a future video, leave it down in the comments as well. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, never stop learning.